Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today was actually pretty highly requested by you guys and after looking more into it, I can definitely see why. It is a very disturbing case and it is a solved case, but knowing how everything was allowed to happen is just so frustrating and unbelievable. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Flamingo. Flamingo makes body hair care so much more comfortable by offering well-designed, high-quality products that support the ever changing realities of your body. They have a quick, easy body care quiz that will help you find the products that you need for your routine. So I'm someone that struggles a lot with razor burn and ingrown hairs and all of that fun stuff. Dealing with these issues honestly makes me want to avoid shaving altogether, but their quiz has helped me find products that work for my specific problems. First, I love their razors. They always give me such a close, smooth shave. And if I ever get an ingrown hair, which happens a lot more than I would like to admit, their ingrown hair spot treatment has got me covered. It honestly makes me so much more confident and comfortable to shave, and I don't have to worry about all those nasty red bumps that you get from ingrown hairs. I also love how convenient and affordable their products are. You can sign up for their amazing, customizable, and flexible subscription service where the blades come directly to your door so you can avoid that moment where you go to shave and then you realize that you're all out of razor. And they cost less than $2 per blade, which is honestly pretty cheap compared to what you usually find at the store. Flamingo products are so easy to use and they work amazingly no matter how often I shave, whether it's every other week or every other day. And my routine, I would say, is pretty much all over the place. It really just depends on the week and how motivated I am. Sometimes I don't shave for a couple of weeks at a time, which I know sounds pretty gross, but sometimes I just get lazy. And then sometimes I have a week where I'm going swimming a lot or doing a lot of outdoor activities and I'm shaving almost every other day. But no matter what your routine is, Flamingo products work amazingly. And Flamingo has products tailored just for you, whether you prefer to shave, wax, or grow. So find your perfect routine and get an extra 10% off of your first order when you take the quiz in my description box below and use code Rachel Shannon. My body hair routine has gotten so much smoother, pun intended, since using Flamingo. So again, make sure you take the quiz in my description box and use code Rachel Shannon for 10% off of your first order. Thanks again so much to Flamingo for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the brutal murder of Colleen Ritzer. Colleen Ritzer was born on May 13th, 1989 to parents Thomas and Peggy Ritzer in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and she was the oldest of two siblings, Laura and Daniel. She was described as an intelligent, talented girl growing up. She went to high school at Andover High School, then went on to college at Assumption College to become a teacher. She was in her second year as a math teacher at Danvers High School at the time of her death. She was described as being such a happy young woman who absolutely loved her family and her friends and her students. She still lived at home at the time, and she also attended Salem State College to work towards her graduate degree. She loved teaching and wanted to be the best at her job that she could. She would often make time to help her students one-on-one -on -one and would even stay at school after hours to help them exceed. She truly was loved by everybody she worked with, including her students. Now, October 22nd, 2013 started as a pretty normal day for 24-year-old Colleen. However, there was one student in particular in her eighth period math class who she noticed was having a particularly rough time. This student was 14-year-old Philip Chisholm. Now, Philip Chisholm did have a bit of a rough upbringing and had just moved to Massachusetts from Clarksville Tennessee, and Colleen noticed that he was a pretty shy kid. His parents had just recently gone through a divorce due to his father's infidelity, and so he was really struggling with that. He had moved many times throughout his childhood, and he moved once again all the way from Tennessee with his mother, and was now living in the basement at his aunt's house. So he really didn't seem to have much stability in his life at all. When he moved, he did join the school's soccer team because he absolutely loved soccer, but still, though those around him who knew him said that he was pretty shy and that he mostly kept to himself and that he didn't really have many friends and Colleen noticed that he was struggling with the material in her class. So he was in her last period of the day and Colleen had asked him to stay after school so that she could talk to him and help him out with his homework. Again, she wanted to make each and every student feel accepted and welcome, so she saw that he was struggling and she wanted to help with that. So 
when she spoke with him, the two were originally talking about something that had to do with China and things seemed to be perfectly fine. But then she brought up his recent move from Tennessee. Now, I don't know exactly what it was that they were talking about, but I imagine that she probably brought it up because she was trying to maybe connect with him and asking him what his life was like back home. I don't know, but either way, after she brought up Tennessee, Philip got visibly upset and uncomfortable. Colleen didn't notice right away, but as soon as she did, she tried changing the subject as quickly as she could, but it didn't seem to work. He was already pretty upset. Now, another student who was near them at the time saw him getting really upset and nobody knows exactly what made him so upset, but it's thought that he was probably just thinking about his parents' recent divorce and her mentioning Tennessee just sort of brought up these negative feelings. So much of what happens after this initial conversation was actually captured on the school surveillance video. So at 2.45 p.m., Colleen walked out of her classroom and made her way down the hall towards the women's bathroom. Then Philip can be seen walking out into the hall, looking around a bit and wandering around for a second and then going back into the classroom. At this point, another student reports seeing him talking to himself but didn't hear exactly what he was saying. He then went back into the hallway again, this time wearing a hood over his head. Then he started walking it towards the same bathroom as Colleen and pulled out a pair of gloves from his pockets. He is seen entering the same bathroom as Colleen and then puts on the pair of gloves. In the bathroom, another student walked in, but they assumed that they had just walked in on someone changing, so this other student left. At 3.07, he is seen leaving the bathroom with the hood still on his head. He then went down the hall and down a few flights of stairs and then outside into the parking lot where he can be seen running, and then he came back inside by 3.09 wearing a white t-shirt, again still running through the halls. He then went back into the classroom and came out once again at 3.11, now wearing a red sweatshirt over his head, carrying what looks like three bags, one being a lunchbox and the others being backpacks, and then he went downstairs. He then came back upstairs without the bags and again is just running through the halls. He then can be seen walking through the hall with a recycling bin and returned back to the bathroom by 316. At this point, he had put on a black ski mask. He then came out of the bathroom at 322, this time wearing his white t-shirt and a black mask while pulling the recycling bin. He then goes into an elevator and goes outside, still with the recycling bin. He can be seen bringing the recycling bin around the school, and this entire time, he can be seen walking past several people who don't interact with him. Then he can be seen entering the school again wearing his white t-shirt and now without the recycling bin, and he appears to be barefoot. He then goes into the bathroom again at 4.02 and changes into a black hoodie and shorts carrying a white Nike backpack and is still barefoot. He is then seen in the parking lot talking to another student, and these students also appear to be barefoot for some reason. We later find out that these are some of his teammates on the soccer team and he's telling them not to go back into the school. He talks to the student for a few minutes before walking off. At 424, he is now seen wearing shoes again and is still wearing the black hoodie. He enters the school again and can be seen walking the halls. At some point, he then grabs another backpack, a red Nike backpack, and carries it with his white backpack. He then walks down the stairs and through the halls, and by 4.30, he finally leaves the school. Now, like I said, Colleen was still living at home at the time of her death, so when she didn't get home from work at her normal time, her dad was immediately worried, and he went over to Danvers High School to look for her. But he didn't find her anywhere, so he contacted another teacher at the school to see if she had seen Colleen but she hadn't. So both Thomas and Peggy went over to the Danvers police station to report Colleen as missing. Around the same time, Philip's mother reported him missing after he didn't show up for soccer practice at his normal time. But initially, police did not connect the two. They started looking for each of them as two separate cases. But then by 12.30 a.m. on October 23rd, police found Philip walking on the side of the road on a nearby highway. So 
police pulled over and they stopped him. He was carrying a backpack at the time and so police decided to search it. Inside of the backpack, police found a box cutter that was absolutely covered in blood and when police asked Philip where this blood came from, he simply stated, the girl. Also inside of his backpack, they found Colleen's credit card as well as her underwear. So immediately police arrested him and charged him with murder. Before that point, police had been searching for Colleen everywhere. But after finding Philip, they knew that they were now searching for a body. And they actually ended up finding her very quickly. She was found in a wooded area right by the school and her body was in horrific condition. She had very clearly been violently attacked. She was found with her shirt pulled up and she was naked below her waist. Her legs had been spread in a sexually demeaning way and a tree branch had been inserted inside of her. They also found a note near her body which read, I hate you all. Near her body, they found a recycling bin and inside of the recycling bin, they found a pair of gloves that were soaked in blood. Turns out, Philip had followed Colleen into the bathroom and then murdered her by slashing her throat 16 times and then went on to rape her. Now, like I said earlier, a student had walked in on them as all of this was taking place, but the student immediately left because she just assumed that somebody was changing. Then after being interrupted, he went out and got the recycling bin and then put her body into it and then took her to the wooded area where he dumped her body on the ground and then sexually violated her once again with this tree branch. Then we know he obviously spent time collecting all of his things and changing his clothes after this. Then obviously again, we know that he stole her underwear as well as her credit card and then he left and then went and bought himself fast food and a movie ticket with Colleen's credit card. So like I said, Philip was arrested and charged with Colleen's murder because it was obvious that he killed her. They looked at the school surveillance video and very quickly were able to map out exactly what happened. So after being charged with the murder, the prosecution wanted to charge him as an adult. But I guess as he was awaiting trial, he was staying at a youth facility, but while in this facility, he committed yet another heinous crime against another woman. In 2014, he attacked a 28-year-old staff member at the facility that he was staying at. He sat and watched her and waited for the perfect moment when nobody was watching. He watched her as she walked into the locker room and then followed her in there and took off his shoes to make sure that she did not hear him coming behind her. He then got up behind her, surprised her, slammed her against a wall, choked her, punched her, and then stabbed her with a pencil. Luckily, another staff member heard what was going on nearby, so they rushed in to save her. So luckily, she did end up being okay. He did end up being charged with attempted murder for this, but it wasn't allowed to be brought up in his upcoming murder trial. Apparently, this was because since it wasn't related, it didn't need to be brought up since the jury's one and only job was to hear the details of Colleen's murder and then decide if Philip was guilty of it. But thankfully, he was tried and found guilty of this attack in a later trial. At the pretrial hearing for Colleen's murder, Philip's defense attorney tried everything that he could to get certain pieces of evidence thrown out before the trial date. First, they said that when police saw Philip walking on the side of the road the morning after or the night of the murder, they had no legal justification to stop him and search him. They said that any evidence they found that night, as well as any of the statements that he made, should not be valid because they violated his Fourth Amendment rights for detaining him and searching him for no reason. At the time that they found him, they didn't know that he was in any way connected to Colleen. The defense argued that the police could have caught up with Philip at a later time after finding evidence that actually connected him to Colleen's murder. However, the officers came back and said that they had no choice but to stop him because of their role as community caretakers. They saw him walking alone in the dark along a narrow stretch of highway in the middle of the night. That is a very dangerous thing to be doing, so police argued that it was their job to stop him and at the very least, check on him. They said that it would have been very irresponsible if they saw him to just let him keep 
walking at that time of the night in the area that he was in. And the judge sided with police. He agreed that it would have indeed been very irresponsible of these police officers if they just saw a young man walking alone in the dark and just let him go off without even checking on him. Again, they did not know at that point that he was in any way connected to Colleen. They saw him and just thought that he was a young man who maybe was in trouble, who they didn't know why he was walking by himself in the middle of the night, and they were concerned. But then, once they realized who it was, that's when they realized that this was a missing person who was reported missing that same night. So, of course, all of that evidence was allowed to be used in court. There were other things that they tried arguing, such as saying that Philip didn't fully understand his Fifth Amendment right to stay silent during the police interrogation. They said that since he was only 14 years old, that he was intimidated by police and didn't fully understand what was going on. He didn't understand that he had the right not to answer questions if he didn't want to. But again, police pointed to his calm demeanor and the way that he composed himself during the police interviews. He knew exactly what he did. He would even correct officers on what he says actually happened when police were going over what they thought happened that night. He chose to disclose certain things while choosing to hide others. The way he spoke and the content of what he said made it very clear that he fully understood what he did and he understood everything that was going on. So the trial for Colleen's murder started on November 16th, 2015, and at that point, Philip was 16 years old and was being tried as an adult. He was being charged with murder in the first degree, two counts of rape, and robbery. Obviously, everybody knew that Philip had murdered Colleen. There was no arguing that. It was obvious. So, the defense's only choice was to come up for an argument as to why this happened and why Philip was not responsible for his actions. The defense made the argument that Philip was suffering from a severe mental illness and that he was in the state of psychosis when he murdered Colleen. Therefore, he's not criminally responsible for his actions. So first, the defense brought forward a bunch of Philip's family and friends to speak on his character. They all described him as a well-behaved, normal, kind young boy who became more and more withdrawn and quiet in the weeks leading up to Colleen's murder. They also brought forward a psychiatrist named Dr. Richard Dudley who took the stand to talk about Philip's psychosis at the time. He argued that Philip had actually been on the schizophrenia spectrum since the age of 10 and that something triggered him to have a psychotic episode and murder Colleen. He said that Philip had heard voices that commanded him to carry out this task. He said that Philip genuinely believed that he was a ninja at the time of the murder and that is why he did what he did. Another psychiatrist and expert in childhood psychosis named Dr. DeVere testified that childhood psychosis can run in families and go undiagnosed before an acute episode happens. She said that if a child is exhibiting some weird behaviors, adults may not notice it and just pass off these weird behaviors as weird teen behavior. She said that teens with psychosis may hear voices and just put on headphones and always want to be listening to music to drown these voices out. She said that kids oftentimes start having unusual ideas and beliefs that just don't make sense and have a lot of bizarre thoughts. But again, she said that a lot of adults just pass these off as a child going through a phase. So a child with schizophrenia may go undiagnosed until it's far too late. She said that a psychotic episode can be triggered by absolutely nothing, or it can be triggered by a huge life transition that can push the child over the edge. She said that some acute episodes can happen where the child doesn't tell anybody about the symptoms that they're experiencing, including hearing voices. So, Nothing is done about it until something big like this happens. The defense also pointed to an incident that happened in court while the trial was happening. So the trial actually had to be put on hold at some point because Philip had a mental breakdown in court. He was subsequently put into a holding cell during the recess, but once he was in there, he refused to leave and he was having a complete meltdown. The judge came over to his cell to see what was happening and saw that Philip was just laying on the floor of a cell, mumbling to himself with his eyes closed. He 
refused to talk to him or answer any of his questions. Apparently, he said to his lawyer that he's going to explode, that he can't take it anymore, that he doesn't want to hurt him or anybody else. So obviously, this can point to him having a severe mental illness that caused some sort of extreme emotional reaction to very difficult things. But a lot of people who commit these heinous crimes have mental illness, and a murder trial is very stressful, and it's understandable why someone may have a mental breakdown when they're facing jail and prison for the rest of their life. So they did do a psyche eval, but he was found competent to stay in trial, so they continued on. So then members of the family took the stand to testify about the family's long-standing history of mental illness. Philip's grandfather, Eduardo, described how his late ex-wife had many bouts of mental illness, which led her to having shock therapy in the 1970s. Now, for a while, while the two were married, Eduardo would work night shifts at a restaurant while his wife, Joyce, would stay at home and take care of the children. He described one incident where he was working his night shift and he came home one random night and found that the kids hadn't been fed and hadn't been taken care of. He said that he started to slice an orange and make dinner when Joyce, so Philip's grandmother, just suddenly fled their home. After this incident, this is when she started undergoing shock therapy sessions. So, he described that Joyce had been completely normal for basically her entire life until this random moment where she just randomly had a mental breakdown and did something very dramatic by just getting up and leaving the family. He then talked about how one of his daughters, so one of Philip's aunts, also suffered from mental illness. He said that she slowly started to show some of the same symptoms as Joyce and saying that she just couldn't handle anything anymore. Now, he did concede that none of these other family members who suffered from mental illness had ever done anything violent, but this does show that the family has a long-standing history of being perfectly fine mentally and then going into these random episodes of psychosis. It runs in their family, so that must be how it happened to Philip. Then a lifelong friend of Philip's, as well as the friend's mother, took the stand to talk about Philip's behaviors growing up. They said that Philip had always been a very respectful and mild-mannered kid to everybody except his mother. They said that he often acted very hateful towards his mother and that it got so bad to the point where this friend's mom told Philip that if he didn't start respecting his mother, that he could no longer hang out with her son. But again, the mom did concede that she didn't notice any huge behavioral changes in the weeks leading up to the murder. So the friend of Philip testified that they would often go out skateboarding, they would go on family vacations together, and they hung out all of the time. But even then, he said that Philip had always been a bit of a shy kid who avoided eye contact and usually just kept to himself. Another friend of Philip's who played soccer with him said that there were times that Philip would come out of his shell when he scored goals, but then he would just revert back to his shy self, would quiet down, and then just didn't want to talk to people as much. So basically what I'm gathering from this is that Philip had always been a nice normal kid, but he was just shy and he just kept to himself, which is completely normal. So the defense was trying to argue that Philip was normally this very outgoing and happy and cheerful kid, but then in the weeks leading up to the murder, there was this shift in behavior which caused him to act more withdrawn and shy and much unlike himself. They were arguing that this recent move with his mother was what triggered his psychotic episode, but the testimonies from his friends and peers showed otherwise. Now, from reading the article, and watching videos of the trial that I saw, it did seem like his friends and peers were trying to defend him, but it seemed like they were kind of going against what the defense wanted them to say. Again, these friends were saying that Philip was happy, that he was a normal kid, but that he was kind of always shy and that he was always pretty withdrawn and that this wasn't anything new for him. So then a psychiatrist also said that he was given antipsychotic meds after his arrest and he apparently got so much better and was starting to show a lot of remorse for what he put Colleen's family through. Philip said that if he hadn't heard the voices telling him what to do, that he wouldn't have have done any of this. The other thing that the defense was trying to do was trying to get the charges of rape taken off. The first rape charge I will talk about in just a minute, but the second rape charge was made because of the stick that was found inserted into Colleen. What I'm about to say is very disturbing and I didn't like reading it as much as you're not going to like hearing it, but the defense said that the reason that he shouldn't be charged with this other rape was because she was most likely already dead when he did this. So again, not arguing that he 
didn't violate her sexually. They were just arguing that she was already dead when he did so. Apparently at this time under Massachusetts law, it's not considered a crime to sexually violate the body of a dead person, which is just absolutely unbelievable to me. It's completely ridiculous that this wasn't ever a law, that it used to not be a law. It's really disgusting, honestly. So the forensic pathologist that completed the autopsy on Colleen's body testified that she was strangled and stabbed in the throat 16 times, but it could not be determined which of these she actually died from. But then she said that it would be very difficult to strangle somebody after her throat being cut, and there was one stab wound in particular that made them think that that was the final blow, which again, we will get more into in just a minute. So the forensic pathologist came to the conclusion that she was most likely strangled and then stabbed. But either way, they argue that him sticking the branch in her was a separate event from the actual murder since it happened over 40 minutes after and that she had apparently died before this and there wasn't any other evidence of rape, so he shouldn't be charged. But then the prosecution argued that he was already raping Colleen in the bathroom before she was actually dead and that the branch was put there because he had actually been interrupted while raping her from this other student. So like I said earlier, as all of this was happening, another student walked into the bathroom, but she left right away because she just thought that she walked in on somebody changing. So the student actually took the stand at trial to talk about what happened with this. So the student said that at the time she had been wandering the halls of the school looking for cell service on her phone so that she could call her father to come pick her up. She said that she then opened the bathroom door to go inside when she saw somebody's bare butt. She said that she saw this person leaning over the sink and that she couldn't hear anything and she couldn't see this person's upper half. So she didn't even realize the gender of this person. She barely stepped into the bathroom and as soon as she saw this, she just up and left because she just thought that somebody was changing and she wanted to give them privacy. She was very surprised and shocked to later find out what was really happening. So like I said, the student really didn't know what she had just witnessed, but because of her reports of seeing a bare butt leaned over the sink, that's obvious that that was when he was in the middle of the act of raping Colleen. And obviously, Philip probably knew that somebody just walked in on them and got spooked and that's when he stopped. So this is some of what the prosecution argued for why the rape charge shouldn't be dropped. We will get more in depth into what the prosecution said about this later, but the defense continued to say that it's unclear when the branch was shoved into her and that she was already dead when it happened, so the charges should be dropped. So that's basically what the defense argued that he was in this state of psychosis and then suddenly snapped when she brought up Tennessee and that is what caused him to just go into overdrive, not even know what he was doing, and then murder her. That this entire thing was in the state of mental crisis and that he didn't know what he was doing, therefore he shouldn't be held responsible for his actions. The prosecution came back and said that Philip was not in fact in the midst of a mental break when this happened. They argued that this entire thing was completely planned out and that his motive was due to a desire for sexual relations with Colleen. So first, the prosecution argued that there was premeditation for this murder. Surveillance video from the school showed that he showed up to school already carrying a box cutter, gloves, a ski mask, and a change of clothes. Then he placed all of these items in a separate backpack and then placed it into his locker. Then surveillance video shows him going into his locker and grabbing this second backpack before going into math class that day. So clearly he went to school prepared with these items, put them in his locker, and then went to class bringing these items knowing that he was going in there to hurt Colleen. Then of course they showed the jury all of the surveillance video which included him walking out of the classroom to check the halls and make sure that everything was clear and then following his teacher into the bathroom and then taking all of the steps to dispose of her body and conceal the crime. So all of this showed that not only did he come to school wanting to hurt Colleen, but he knew very well that what he was doing was wrong. The psychiatrist Robert Kinsherf conceded that he may have been emotionally and mentally disturbed, but his actions show that he knew exactly what he was doing and he knew that what he was doing was wrong. So even if he was declining in his mental health in the weeks leading up to the murder, even if everybody in his life can attest to that, even if everybody can say that his behaviors were changing in the weeks leading up, that doesn't change the fact that he planned this murder, he went to school prepared to do this murder, carried it out, and then took the steps to conceal it. 
That shows that he knew very well that what he was doing was wrong. The prosecution also pointed to the condition of Colleen's body after she had been dumped in the woods. She was placed in a very sexually demeaning way, and they said that him shoving the branch into her was overkill to further inflict damage onto a victim who could no longer defend herself. They said that this indicated a need to humiliate his victim and to show that he has power over her. Then, after the murder, he changed his clothes and got himself cleaned up. If he were psychotic and in this crazy mental state, he wouldn't have had the presence of mind to change out of his bloody clothes and cover his tracks. After the murder, he went to a restaurant to eat food and then went to a movie theater and bought some movie tickets. All the while, he was acting completely normal and making sure to go unnoticed. If he truly were in a psychotic episode, he wouldn't have been able to go about the rest of his day acting completely normal and ordinary. He wouldn't have been able to appear so composed and completely control his actions and he would have been noticed by others. Then, once he was questioned by police and other psychiatrists, he was fully able to communicate clearly. He was able to distinguish a fantasy from reality and he was reserved and guarded during certain aspects of the interviews, taking note to cover up certain details. Details. The prosecution argued that Philip malingered and exaggerated his symptoms to falsely appear more mentally ill than he was to purposely get diagnoses from doctors. They pointed out that a year prior to the murder, he had taken an IQ test that showed that he was slightly above average intelligence. But then, all of a sudden, the IQ test that he took after the murder shows that he falls well below the first percentile for intelligence. The psychiatrist argued that in absence of some sort of catastrophic injury to the brain, that this could not happen, this drop in IQ could not happen unless Philip was purposely faking to skew the results. Another psychiatrist, Nancy Hebben, conducted a widely used personality test that showed that Philip was trying to fake mental illness. She said that this test was completely unbiased because it was scored by a computer and that the results of this test led the computer to finding the test invalid. So even if someone wanted to argue that all of these psychiatrists were very biased against Philip because they wanted to get a charge, they wanted to show that he wasn't mentally ill, they wanted to make sure that he paid for his crime, even if you wanted to argue that, a computer can't lie, a computer isn't biased, and a computer can't skew results unless someone is faking it. So then let's go back to the whole idea of the defense trying to get the rape charge taken away because she was allegedly already dead before any of the rape took place. The prosecution again argued that he was in the act of raping Colleen in the bathroom before the student walked in and interrupted him. They said that they believe that Colleen did not receive the final stab wound that actually killed her when she was in the bathroom, but that this actually took place in the woods. They believe that while she was barely alive, that she was alive in the recycling bin as she was being dragged into the woods. So first, they pointed out to the lack of blood that was on Philip's shirt once he initially left the bathroom to go and get the recycling bin. They also said that there wasn't a ton of blood inside of the recycling bin. The only thing that was bloody at that point after she had been attacked in the bathroom was Philip's glove that he was wearing. So this shows that Philip did attack her, did stab her in the bathroom, but that the final stab wound that actually killed her had not taken place yet. The final stab wound that they believe actually killed Colleen was the one that pierced her throat enough to actually nick one of her vertebra. That would have caused the profuse bleeding that they only saw once she was outside of the recycling bin. So this shows that this final blow probably happened after she was already in the woods, and this shows that she was alive when she was brought into the woods. They also pointed out that Philip was in the woods for over 25 minutes. They said that after Philip emerged from the woods, it was at that point that he was actually covered in blood. They said that he took her into the woods to finish what he started and that he continued raping her and then finished off by sexually violating her with the branch and then posing her in the way that he did. So they said that she was fully alive when she was taken into the woods and that the final blow was made out there. So, all of this to say that the rape charge shouldn't be dropped because she was still alive when she was raped and possibly when the branch was shoved into her. I think that it's stupid that they had to make this argument in the first place. He raped her. They know that. And the fact that they're trying to argue like, oh, she was probably dead when this happened, so he shouldn't be charged with rape is 
ridiculous, disgusting, like I said earlier, but it's something that happened and it's something that I wanted to go over to make sure that we know all of the information in this case. But either way, after he murdered Colleen, as we saw on surveillance video, he went over and just started talking to a classmate. And at this point, he was acting completely normally. Apparently, they had a totally normal conversation. Like I said earlier, he told them not to go into the school, but apparently they had also made plans for the weekend and just had a completely normal conversation. So it was obvious that he either had no remorse and no emotions at that point, or he was really trying to cover up what he just did, or both. So that's pretty much the bulk of what each side argued at trial for this case. Again, the defense tried saying that he was in the middle of a psychotic break and that he had no idea what he was doing, while the prosecution said that this entire thing was planned and that he went to school that day with a horrible, horrible goal. He planned to do these acts and he carried them out all because he wanted sexual relations with his teacher. So after about four weeks of hearing testimony from both sides, 17 jurors went into deliberation on December 15th, 2015. They actually deliberated for over 10 hours over the course of two days before delivering their verdict. They found him guilty of first degree felony murder, armed robbery for stealing her credit card and underwear, and one count of aggravated rape. He was found not guilty of the second charge of aggravated rape of the tree branch because the jury did decide that she was dead at the time that her body was taken into the woods. As the verdict was read, Philip showed absolutely no emotion. Foreman, what say you to indictment number 2013-1446? Charging the defendant, Philip Chisholm, with murder in the first degree. Is the defendant guilty or not guilty? And if guilty, guilty of what? On what theory? Guilty, deliberate premeditation, and extreme atrocity with cruelty. Mr. Foreman, what say you to indictment number 2013-1447-001, charging the defendant with aggravated rape? Is the defendant guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Mr. Foreman and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, hearken to your verdict as the court has recorded it. You, upon your oath, do say that the defendant, Philip Chisholm, is not guilty on indictment number 2013-1447-001, charging him with aggravated rape. So say you, Mr. Foreman? Yes. So say you all, members of the jury? Yes. yes. Uh, on indictment 2013-1447-002, charging the defendant with armed robbery. Mr. Foreman, what say you is the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Mr. Foreman, on indictment number 2014-109, charging the defendant, Philip Chisholm, with aggravated rape, what say you is the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Now, it's a little bit confusing because he did face the charges as an adult and he received a sentence of 15 to 25 years to life for the murder and then 40 years for the robbery and then 40 years for the rape, all of which are being served concurrently. It's confusing because he is up for parole in 15 to 25 years for the murder, but he faced 40 years for the other charges, which kind of makes no sense to me, but because of that, he probably won't be up for parole until he's in his 50s. Now, like I said, it's a little bit confusing because even though he faced the charges as an adult, the reason for him being sentenced to 15 to 25 years for the murder is because the law in Massachusetts actually says that the court cannot sentence juveniles 17 or younger to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So I don't really quite understand that. I don't understand how he was able to be charged as an adult, but he couldn't be sentenced as an adult. I don't fully understand that. Maybe it's just he was being tried an adult for the other charges and not the murder. That might make sense to me. I don't really know, but if you know more about this, please let me know because it is a little bit confusing to me. Of course, him being in jail is no replacement for what Colleen's family tragically lost, but at least they can know that the monster responsible for this vicious murder is behind bars. And I sincerely hope that he's never given parole. Just because he does have the possibility of parole doesn't mean that it's guaranteed to be granted, so I just hope that he does stay in prison for the rest of his life. But even so, even with the conviction of their daughter's murderer, her parents were still left with so many unanswered questions, with the biggest question being, how was this allowed to happen in a school without 
anybody noticing? And that's a really good question. As I was watching all of this surveillance video, and you might have had the same thoughts as you were watching the surveillance video, but I thought that it was crazy how long he was able to just walk the halls of the school after school hours without anybody saying anything. I was in high school around the same time that this happened, and I remember when I was in high school, if I was walking by myself, especially in after school hours, I was stopped by so many staff members asking me what I was doing. Even when I was involved in after school sports, I would get in trouble for standing in the halls for too long in after school hours. So watching him walk by multiple people in the halls especially with a recycling bin without anybody saying anything is really weird to me. So Colleen's parents filed a wrongful death suit because of this. The suit claimed that it was irresponsible that nobody in the school noticed his obvious suspicious behaviors as he walked around the school after hours for almost an hour. They also noted how nobody was monitoring the surveillance videos that were captured on a live monitor at the school. It was also known that after the murder, the janitors were literally called to clean up blood in the bathroom, but police were not called. Nobody knew anything about anything until hours later when the parents of Philip and Colleen reported them missing. The cleaning company completely cleaned the blood out of the bathroom, getting rid of so much potential forensic evidence and reporting nothing to police. So the cleaning company that worked for the school was also named in this suit. Now, a lot of people can say that it doesn't really matter that they cleaned up all of this evidence because he was convicted of the murder anyways, but I do think that it's kind of a big deal and that this could have helped a lot in the trial as to knowing exactly when Colleen was murdered. If there wasn't a ton of blood that they had pictures of and could show the jury, then they might have known that she wasn't killed in that bathroom and that it's more likely that she was killed in the woods. And maybe they would have found him guilty of rape if they just were able to examine how much blood was in the bathroom to see, was she alive at this point? Was there a lot of blood? Was there not a lot of blood? that could have helped a lot in this trial. So again, a lot of you might be wondering, why does it even matter? Why are they making this lawsuit? Someone cleaned up blood, so what? He's still behind bars. But to me, I think that this could have helped a lot in the trial. And I think that this is very important evidence that got cleaned up. And I think it's really weird that you go into a bathroom and you see blood, even if it's not a lot, even if someone cut themselves, even if you think, oh, someone probably just cut themselves pretty badly. Even if you see that, you should say something. A kid probably went in that bathroom and either cut himself or got cut or was hurt by somebody else. There's really no reason that blood should be in a school bathroom, and I think the fact that they didn't call police is very irresponsible. However, the cleaning company was not found liable of anything in this suit. They stood on the grounds that, quote, it does not allege that any of the plaintiffs witnessed Chisholm's attack, came upon the crime scene while Colleen was still there, or even observed the horrifically bloody crime scene. So, based on that, the judge motioned to dismiss the suit for emotional distress that this incident caused the family. They also found that the cleaning firm did not owe a duty of care to the Ritzer family that would make them legally liable for anything. But the wrongful death suit against the security at the school was allowed to stand because of, quote, the negligent design and implementation of the security system as a whole was a substantial contributing factor in causing Colleen's death. But I have not heard anything else about where this suit went. I don't know how long these type of things are supposed to take, but I haven't really seen anything about this stated within the past couple of years. But but I have seen that the family is using Colleen's death to do something good for their community. They have set up the Colleen E. Ritzer Memorial Scholarship, which benefits graduating high school seniors who reside in Andover and Danvers, who are going into a degree field of education at a four-year university, which I think is just so cool. So at the end of the day, after hearing all of the evidence, I wholeheartedly agree with the prosecution's argument. I think he knew exactly what he was doing, he knew that it was wrong, and the evidence shows that. I think it's obvious that he was emotionally and mentally disturbed. He was going through a lot of things that are very difficult, and his life was not necessarily easy. But literally anybody, in my opinion, who is capable of murder 
has something wrong with them mentally. I think it's a stupid argument to say, oh, somebody was mentally ill and they couldn't control their actions and that's why they shouldn't be held responsible for the murder. I don't think that anybody who's mentally healthy and mentally well is gonna go on to murder somebody. It's a given, that just doesn't happen. Literally almost anybody who commits a murder has at least something mentally wrong with them. So using that argument is really stupid in my opinion. Maybe I'm too harsh about all this. I don't know, let me know what you guys think, but to me, I think it's just a dumb argument. I do understand if somebody didn't know right from wrong, but this question of whether he knew what he was doing was right or wrong is obvious. He took the obvious steps to cover up what he was doing. He made sure that nobody saw him, so that in and of itself shows that he knew that what he was doing was wrong. So those are pretty much all of my thoughts on this case. I know this was a very disturbing case. It was very difficult to listen to, but that seems to be sort of the trend of the past few videos. They've all been very, very difficult cases, all very traumatic cases and disturbing cases. But that doesn't mean that they don't deserve to be spoken on because Colleen, she was a beautiful soul. She was a beautiful human. She had so much potential. My heart absolutely goes out to all of Colleen's family, friends, and all of her students who had the honor of being in one of her classes. Her students absolutely loved her. She left a mark on so many lives and her death has affected so many people. Again, she had so much potential to help so many lives. It just shatters my heart that she was murdered because she was trying to help somebody. She literally went out of her way to help Philip and he repaid her by taking her life. It's disgusting and I'm really happy that he's behind bars because especially given this other attack that he committed against this other woman, it's obvious that he would have kept doing this if he was allowed to be out of prison. But either way, I'm just rambling at this point, so that is where I'm going to end today's video, but I do want to hear your guys' thoughts about all of this. What do you think of the argument that the defense was making versus the prosecution? Do you think the prosecution got it right, or do you think that there was some other motive? Or do you think that the defense had it right and that he really was in a psychotic break? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn on the notifications so you don't miss any of my future videos. Don't forget to click the link down below and head over to Flamingo and take their quiz so that you can find your perfect routine. Make sure to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram, both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncase at gmail.com. I read every case suggestion that I receive, so don't hesitate to send those suggestions over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!